and welcome. Hello, everyone. We are back and we are here to deliver a special session for this beautiful day. And we're going to be focusing on a message that I believe is going to be beneficial to you, that you may hear one idea in the next 30 minutes that we're here together that may shift things for you, because that is exactly what happened to me. Let's see. What does this say? Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Jarius Lovell. It's nice to meet you. It's great to have you guys here with us. We're going to be talking today about the greatest lessons that I have ever learned from the amazing and the extraordinary Bob Proctor. And I want to, I have a question for you. How many of you are familiar with Bob Proctor or perhaps even studied with Bob Proctor? Who else? Who else has studied with Bob Proctor? Type in the chat box if you've ever studied Bob Proctor, watched a video, been to an event, maybe you're involved in his organization somehow. So let's see. Yes. All right. I have. Okay. Great stuff. All right. Hello. Hello. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll people all over the world. Yeah. Bob Proctor uh, began working in the field of personal development many, many years ago. He left this earthly plane. In February this year, he passed on uh, from here and moved on to the next part of his eternal journey on February 3rd, 2022. And it was just about a year ago that I was at his home with my husband and we had dinner with his wife and uh, two other couples, three other couples, actually. And um, I had met Bob in January 1979. And so for the event today, I've decided that I'm going to share with you some of the greatest lessons that I've ever learned from Bob Proctor. The challenge that I'm going to have is that we're here together for about 30 minutes, 29 more as of right now. And yes, you can ask questions and I'll take some questions as we're going through this, but it would be impossible for me to share with you everything that I've learned from Bob Proctor. So I'm going to just pick some of the highlights. And if you've ever studied any of my work, any of my books, because Bob Proctor was not only a dear friend, he was a mentor. He was someone that I learned from. I met him in January 1979 at a seminar that he was delivering. And it was during that seminar that he said something that completely shifted my way of thinking. And the truth is this. You could hear something like a quote or a story or a message or see something like a quote or a story or a message and it can positively shift things for you. It could shift the way you look at things. It could have you thinking about things a little differently. And last evening, I was actually on a call with Mary Morrissey, who was also a very dear friend of Bob Proctor and very likely his closest friend. And Mary Morrissey is an incredible woman, and, and I've been blessed to know her and work with her. We ran some seminars together as well, and we were talking about Bob and the extraordinariness, if that's a word, and if not, it is now, of Bob. And uh, we're talking about the things that we had learned and how impactful he was in our life as well. And so one of the things that I will be doing in the, in the near few months that are coming up is I am going to be releasing my 21st book. Yes, that's right, my 21st book. And it is a fiction book. And the fiction uh, is, is a series. This fiction book is the third and a sequel. And this particular book that I'm writing right now is called Savvy Wisdom from Beyond. Savvy Wisdom from Beyond. And this is where it's a, it's a third book in a series. The other books are Savvy Wisdom. You can see them behind my shoulder here up on the, the shelf. And Savvy Wisdom and Savvy Wisdom 2. And they're based on, a, there's a character that was created by the name of Sophie, who meets a gentleman, a very wise, incredible gentleman by the name of Savvy. And he guides her to turn her life around, to transform her life. And a lot of things go on in these books, in these stories. And it's all based on Savvy is actually Bob Proctor. And that's who that character is. And Sophie is me. So in this book, because the real Savvy, Bob Proctor, has passed on, then, um, thank you, Vladdy. Then this one here, Savvy Wisdom, is how do you communicate with loved ones that have 
passed on that have left this earthly plane. And there's a, a relationship that continues on with Savvy and Sophie in this book in a very unique way. And so you definitely will want to get that. I'm launching it on the anniversary of Bob Proctor's passing. And I really believe that it not only honors who he was, but it honors the messages that Bob Proctor brought to this world. You see, Bob had such a passion and was completely committed to the study of personal development. Why? Well, a couple of reasons. One is so that he can create better results in his life and also so that he could help others, help many others, millions of others, in fact. And I'm one of the people that Bob Proctor helped. So I began studying him in January 1979, and some of you may not even been born at that time. And I began studying him back then, and I've never stopped and never looked back. And I've learned a lot, but it's not about what you're learning. And so let's start with that. One of the very first lessons that I learned from Bob Proctor is this. No amount of learning, no amount of going to seminars, no amount of reading the books is going to bring you anything or change your life. The only time that you will experience transformation is when you understand and apply. And so you think of it, you think about the study, the understand and apply, which is what we do in Club Achieve. And check out Club Achieve because everyone should be a member of this. It is such a valuable membership program. And it's one that I lead where we study. I give the understanding and the application. But that's really why results happen in this world. Your results and anybody else's results, including my own, is because of the application. And that's, I believe, one of the reasons why Bob had invited me to speak at many of his events, because I was applying what I was learning. It wasn't just learning it. And there were some people that were really great students, phenomenal students. In fact, they would rave about the number of events that they had been to and the number of books that they had studied. However, what does it matter unless you're understanding it and applying it? You must be applying if you really want to get the results. And when we're talking about applying, it's not just a once in a while thing. It's a continual thing. You must be applying these principles of success in your life every single day, every single day, bar none and really using your mental faculty called your will in a disciplined way and focusing, like holding the ideas with your will, using your imagination, seeing the end result as if it's in your life right now, connecting to it emotionally, which means you're on the frequency of it, which means you are vibrating in harmony with the outcome. And it also means you're attracting it into your life. And so all of that, all of those were lessons that I learned from Bob. But the very first lesson, and there were really two significant lessons that I learned the very first time that I ever met him. And that's what I want to share with you today are just the significant lessons. There's more, as I said. And the first one was when Bob Proctor quoted by an author by the name of Vernon Howard, that you cannot escape from a prison unless you know you're in one. And if you think about the logic of that statement, or even the common sense of that statement, you can't escape from a prison unless you know you're in one. Well, of course, right? It just seems like a natural hello, duh, you know, as you know, some people might say. And the truth is that if you don't realize that you're stuck, if you don't realize that you are in your own way, not to judge yourself, not to get upset at yourself, in fact, you can look at that and say, wow, I have put myself in a prison of my own making. I am in my own way. And knowing that you're vibrating or acting or behaving in a way that's not in harmony with what you desire, all you need to do is change it, right? So awareness is really key. Awareness is everything. Awareness, and this is one of my own quotes, awareness is like light is to a dark room. That's really what awareness is. It sheds light. So if you're willing to be aware, which I believe is a healthy thing to do, and certainly a progressive and a positive thing to do, if you're willing to be aware, then you can experience growth. And it's not that there's anything wrong with you. You're perfect just the way you are. 
But if you want your results to be better, which I suspect many of you do, if you want your results to get better, then you must get better. And when you get better, your world will change. One of the stories that I wrote about in Savvy Wisdom, the very first book in the series, is a story of when Savvy meets Sophie and he gives her this handkerchief and it has an embroidery on the handkerchief. And on the handkerchief, it's written, if you want your life to change, you must change. If you want your life to change, you must change. And this was a message that Savvy delivered to Sophie because she was in a very dark place and she was struggling and suffering and she was suffering what might be considered unnecessarily. And you know what? Many people suffer unnecessarily. They're suffering in emotional pain. They're suffering in lack. They're suffering being consumed in fear. They're suffering in not even seeing the way out of their current situation. It doesn't have to be like that. They might even be suffering with grief. Does not have to be like that. Suffering is actually a choice. Now, that may sound like a strong statement, but it's a choice. When you have awareness, when you've heightened your awareness, when you realize that you're the one that's in control of how you feel, then you'll realize that you can change how you feel when you're not feeling terrific. Now, I am not saying that you'll never feel bad or that you'll never feel grief or that you'll never feel sadness or that you won't worry or you won't have doubt. You very likely will have all of those experiences. What I'm suggesting is that you develop the awareness to notice. Notice when you're feeling any emotion that's not in harmony with what you desire and make a decision to switch it or just choose to look at things a little differently. This is what you want to do. You want to look at things a little differently. Now, when we're thinking about looking at things differently, you're looking at it in a more positive way. What's great about this? What can you learn from this? Where's the benefit in this? There's got to be a seed of greatness in this somewhere, even if it is the most traumatic experience that's happened. And that's a big part of what I will be delivering in the book, Savvy Wisdom from Beyond, is, you know, because Savvy, also known as Bob, had a very unique view of death. He wasn't afraid of death and he felt he was ready. You know, he was willing and we actually accept, we choose that as well as part of this experience. And he talked about that. He talked about that we never, ever die, that the soul lives on. It lives on. Now, I know, you know, his philosophy on this is quite unique and unlike most people, the way most people think, but it's a refreshing and interesting kind of idea and ideas. And Bob was such a serious student of these materials that he had had a depth of understanding unlike any other human being that I've ever met. He was truly unique. And I loved everything about Bob. I loved how he deeply cared about you. He cared about everyone. He cared about humankind. He just cared about people. And he wanted to help everyone. And he was always willing to help people. He was the most generous person that I ever met. And one of the things that Bob said about uh, prosperity is this. He said, generosity is the first law of prosperity. Generosity is the first law of prosperity. And so Bob wasn't generous because he knew that law or because he would give something, whether it's of himself or of his advice or of something physical. He didn't give it with his hand out going, what's in it for me or how will I receive? He gave of himself because he knew that was his contribution to mankind, that it was going to serve another. And in fact, he also realized that by serving another, it was good for him too, because he would be giving something of value. And that value came from within. He had that within. And so it re-emphasized the value that he had. So generosity is the first law of prosperity. So you could think about, since we're talking about studying, understanding, and applying, you can think about for yourself, and how can you help? How can you contribute? How can you do more today? Whether it's do something of 
of kindness, an act of kindness, opening a door for a stranger, paying for the vehicle behind you when you're going through one of those lineups through a, a drive through coffee bar, whether it's helping someone who's in times of challenge, whether it's posting something online that's going to brighten up people's lives, you know, whatever it is, there is absolutely a way that you can bring value to another person. So even though Bob said a lot, and he had a lot of programs and a lot of books and a lot of audios and videos, etc. Phenomenal information, valuable information. Where I believe I learned a lot from Bob was from observation, from watching him, watching the way he interacted with people, watching the way he carried himself physically, watching the way he communicated his message on stage. You know, sometimes we can learn so much by observation by simply watching people, paying attention to what they're doing and how they're doing it. And that can be extremely valuable to you. So I learned that too. Bob had a great sense of humor as well, but he was very cautious on where he used his humor. So if somebody said something that was deflaming, you know, maybe it was self, you know, criticism or, or something along those lines, he would say this, don't even joke about it. And I remember the first time I heard him say that, he would say, don't even joke about it. And the reason is because of his loving nature, because he deeply cared, and because he knew that anything that you put out into the world, whether it's through the energy of your words, whether it's an energy of your feelings, your thoughts, whatever, it's drawing back to you like energy. So even if you're saying, you know, that you'll never you know, amount to anything or that you're clumsy or useless or always will be that way or always struggle the way you're struggling, even if you're saying it as a joke. His response, don't do that, don't say that, is very valid and very loving. Because when you're saying things, deflaming yourself or even in somebody else, you're hurting yourself, even if it's justified, even if you may think it's true, you are hurting yourself. So I love that about Bob that he would correct people and he would do that because he loved them, because he cared about them. He had that deep caring for his fellow man. And all he wanted to do was lighten up. I remember, you know, having conversations after Bob's passing and, you know, he was going through some health challenges in the last few weeks of his life and he had been hospitalized and things like that. But when he was out of the hospital, even though he wasn't feeling well, I remember one time he was, you know, feeling quite exhausted. And I don't remember who told me this story, but he was at his kitchen table and he had a call scheduled and someone had suggested that they reschedule the call. And he said, no, 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 I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then it was time for the call. And he'd been laying on his, his table, his kitchen table, wasn't feeling well. And it was time for him to go on, if you will, like get on a Zoom call or do a live event or whatever it was, or go on a video or work with somebody or whatever, whatever the requirement was at that time. And it was almost like he just snapped, snapped out of it, sat up and just gave his all. And, you know, he said this many, many years ago, and I want you to listen to these words. Here's what Bob said. He said, a professional is at their best regardless. Our professional is at their best regardless. I remember being in the green room, like behind the stage, you know, we're at an event and Bob was going on next and he was in pain. He had, he had a, a challenge with his sciatic in his back and it was giving him a lot of pain. He ended up having some surgery, which alleviated the pain. But when he was in pain, he was in massive pain. And you could see it, you could see it in his face if you were behind the curtain. And there was one time we were in the green room and he was about to go on stage. And I said to him, I said, Bob, like, you don't have to do this. I'll go on for you or someone else will go on. Like we can take, take over. Like, don't, don't be concerned about it. You take care of yourself. And he's like, nope, I'm going. Those people count on me. And he was such a responsible man. So by that, it demonstrated, yes, the professionals at their best regardless. But when you make a commitment, you follow through. What did Bob do? He jumped on stage. And not only did he deliver, it was phenomenal. So I left the green room. He went on stage and I went and sat in the, in the ballroom and watched him. And it blew my mind. 
I mean, it was absolutely mesmerizing watching him get on stage and move and work the crowd and deliver his messages, his powerful messages. And you would never know that minutes before he was in the back room in excruciating pain. And then bam, snap. It's like you just, it's like you're, uh, and then snap out of it and die and you deliver. I'll never, ever, ever forget that. What an extraordinary thing. What do most people do when they're in pain or they're not feeling well? They just want to pull the covers over their head, right? Go back to bed, say, forget it. Like, I'm not doing this. Somebody else do it. And somebody else could have easily done it, but not Bob. And so that was such a great example of commitment, of being a person of your word. If you say you're going to do something, you follow through, of having such a passion for what he did, which he had, and also to be a professional at his best, regardless of what was going on. And you think about it also with what he taught about the power of your mind, how you can overcome challenges and you can do it, bam, like that. You know, there's a story, there's a, there's a book that I study, um, a book called The Secret of the Ages by Robert Collier. It is one of the books that we will be studying in our Club Achieve, by the way. And when we study in Club Achieve, we don't just study for the sake of, oh, let's just do some reading and and we're going to you know read a few pages in a book. When I'm studying, I look at it as a teaching opportunity because we get into the understanding and then the depth of the material so that you can apply it. But there's a story in this book by, uh, by Robert Collier where he talks about overcoming incredible challenges and like for health and strength. And I believe it's in chapter 21 called The Sculptor and the Clay. And he told this story, and I believe it's in this chapter. I'm just gonna see if I can find it right now. And he, he there's a story in here where there was a hospital ward. Um, I don't remember where the hospital was. Let's see if we can find it here. And I, I think what I'll do is I'll just, tell you the story because I'm not sure exactly where it is. But the story goes that there was a hospital and on the hospital floor, there were a number of patients. And I think there were eight patients, if my memory serves me correctly. You'll get the idea of the message anyways. There were eight patients that were all paralyzed, uh, apparently couldn't walk. They couldn't walk on their own, you know, without assistance or without a wheelchair. I mean, they couldn't move. And a very poisonous snake, I think it was a boa constrictor, had crawled through a window in this hospital and ended up being loose on the floor where all these patients were, all these patients that weren't able to physically move from the waist down. And within minutes, within minutes, every one of those patients on their own accord got up and walked out of there or ran out of there. They got out of there. Why? because they were afraid for their life. They were fearful for their life. They were concerned that this snake was going to bite them and kill them. And so they got out of their bed and they walked. Was it a miracle? Some people might call it a miracle. But what did they do? They used the power of their mind. You probably heard the stories of, of mothers that lift vehicles off a child, right? Child gets caught somewhere and the mother you know, lift something that's thousands of pounds? How is that even possible? Well, it's not possible if I go outside and I try and lift my neighbor's car. I mean, that's just not going to happen, right? But with the power of the mind, you see, we have so much power. And Bob used to say this all the time. We have so much power locked up within us. And these are examples and stories of how people do it. And I watched him. I watched him do it. He had so much power locked up in his mind. Like even on the 31st of December last year, I had asked Bob if he was willing to do an interview. So somewhere around, I think the 27th of December, I got an idea. I was doing an event and I was doing this event and the event was for the new year because we're approaching the new year. By the way, we're doing another one. It's coming up. It's called Be Free and 23. So you can go to BeFreeAnd23.com. You can join. It's free, completely free. We're doing three sessions. And so last year I was doing the same thing. And somewhere around the 27th, I got the idea, I want to interview Bob about goals. And I think it'd be a great 
valuable bonus for anyone that's coming on my event. That was free. And so I text Bob. I said, hey, Bob, you willing to do this? And he said, sure. You know, when and where? So we booked it for late afternoon on the 31st of December. And on that day, I received a text from someone that was very close to Bob. And they had asked me to let them know how Bob was doing after the interview. And I found that rather interesting that they were asking me to let them know how Bob was doing. Because I thought, well, wouldn't they know? And because I was going to be seeing him on a Zoom call, I guess they wanted, you know, my opinion. Oh, how did he look? What I didn't know, I didn't know this till after the fact, but Bob was sick actually at that time. And so when Bob turned on the Zoom, like screen, he was in a hotel. He was in Las Vegas, which he frequently went for New Year's. And he was in Las Vegas at the time. And uh, he didn't look very well. And I could tell he was tired and he, of course, didn't admit that he was not feeling well or whatever. And he was fully on board to do the interview where most people would have canceled. Most people would have canceled, but he did it anyway. It's like that expression, the show must go on. And not only did he deliver a phenomenal session, but it was such a powerful interview. And I believe it was the last interview that he ever did. And we're going to be including that in our event when we launch Savvy Wisdom from Beyond, because we've got a number of very unique bonuses that we're going to include. And we'll give you more information on that as we get closer to the date. But there again, this incredible man who physically was not feeling well, it was only five weeks, and I think not even five weeks before he passed on. And he was like, yes, I'm happy to do the interview. I'm there with you. I will deliver it. Again, an extraordinary man who taught us all how to show up and then not only show up, but give it your best when you're there. All right. So I hope you're inspired by that. There's certainly a lot more that I that I can uh, address. OK, so I know we've got a few questions that have already been submitted. Fred, I see yours there as well. And so I'm going to go to those questions right now. All right. So Natasha is asking the question, how did you attract healthy, honest love? I love that question. You know, and we're, we're talking about Bob today, too, and I'm certainly going to answer that question. But Bob played a role in that. I remember having a conversation with him, and he said this. He said, what kind of a relationship would you like to have? And what kind of a person would you like to have? Describe them. And you can do the same thing. You know, describe the kind of person that you would love to be with. You know, what are they like? What are their values? What's most important to them? And then he asked this question. And this is a question you can ask yourself. Is that who you are? Is that how you are? Are these your values? Is that how you show up in the world? So if you want your partner to be honest, are you honest? If you want your partner to be committed, are you committed? If you want your partner to be romantic, are you romantic? If you want your partner to be loving, are you loving? And it's a simple, simple understanding, simple idea, but you first must be it. When you're that person, you will attract that person in your life. But to take it even further, because the question was how, is you've got to imagine using your imagination, actively imagine that this person is in your life now. You must see it and feel it. Whether you know what they look like, smell like, touch like, just you got to imagine that they're in your life right now. And that's what I did. So I made a decision on the kind of person that I would attract into my life. And I determined what that relationship would be like. And I just started to imagine. I'm out walking my dog. I'm holding his hand as I'm walking my dog. Going out for dinner, I'm imagining he's opening the door of the car. I'm imagining that we're going on trips together, that we're celebrating family events together. And I did that all in my imagination. And then a couple of weeks later, I met my husband. He was moving into the neighborhood. And as soon as I saw him, I thought, wow, I really like like that. We started a chat. I realized we had the same values. And then we started dating. And it was about, I don't know, two years later, after dating that we were married, maybe two and a half years later, we were married. And that's how I did it. What's your what is your favorite message that Bob shared with you? Sue asks, I would say it is that you don't have to know how you don't have to know how don't have to know how you're going to accomplish the goal that you set for yourself. You have to decide. You have to decide what you would love. 
You do have to determine what that feels like because the feeling will attract it into your life. But don't worry about the how. You know, I've set objectives uh, for the last 44 years from studying Bob. Don't know. I have any idea how I'm going to get there. Don't have any idea how I'm going to accomplish the goals that I've set for myself right now. But I don't have to know how. That's the great part. So that's my favorite message that Bob shared with me. Okay, we have one more question and then we're going to call it a wrap for today. This one's from Fred. He says, how do you stay focused on your goal and prevent your mind from drifting away? It, it is a, it's determination. It really is. It, you've got to be determined that you are going to keep your attention focused on your goal and it may wander away. But if you get really good at putting your attention back when it wanders, put it back, you know, the moment, develop a high, heightened awareness, notice and put it back. And the best way to do that is through what I call triggers, right? Use tools, absolutely have tools, have signs all around you, messages around you, affirmations, goal cards, have your power life script handy. And I'm assuming you all have a power life script. And if you don't, you must get one. It's essential for reprogramming your subconscious mind. And I'll just push play on my phone and my power life script will just start playing. And it's being impressed into my subconscious mind because of the repetition. And that's what you must do. Now, I also call those switching strategies. So I'll ask myself a question. If I find I've gone off track, I'll just say, what would you really love? What would you love? What would you love? What would you love? Okay, that puts me back on track. Or I'll look at an image that I have on my desk because I have a vision board there. I have images on my desk. I have signs around me and I'll just reconnect with those. I'll take a moment and get quiet and visualize. And that is a great way to put yourself back on track. OK, we're going to call it a wrap for today. I want you to go to Be Free in 23, Be Free in 23 and get registered for the event. Okay, here's a sorry, another question just snuck in here. So I'm going to get that. If you repeat an affirmation 100 times 30 days, will you believe it? it? Depends. You may not. You've got to accept it. So repeating affirmations is not the ticket to success. It's not the way to get to the destination. You got to believe it. And you got to be willing to believe it. So you say it like you believe it. Thanks, George. So you say it like you believe it. So if you're saying an affirmation, if you're saying, I am a happy and a healthy multimillionaire, I would suggest that you feel it at the same time. And if you do, you should be feeling it immediately. And you will build the belief system. Absolutely. But you don't stop there. You keep affirming and keep affirming and keep affirming. So it's a never ending opportunity is really what it is. You're very welcome. So say it with conviction. Say it like you mean it. And you will believe it. Absolutely. All right. Be free in 23. I'll see you guys on that event. That's next week. It's free. It's a totally free event. Yes, we are recording it, but get on the event live because we're going to do some special gift giving. It's the holiday. It's the season for giving. We're going to be giving some things away, but you have to be there live in order to get the gifts. So join us next Tuesday, December the 13th. And we will be going through be free in 23, how you can set yourself up. So that 2023 is your best year ever. Is that something you'd love? Excellent. Well, we want to help you get there. All right, everyone. Thank you, Roddy. Thank you, Vladdy. I really appreciate you guys. And we'll see you again at Be Free in 23. <laughs> Bye-bye for now.